Welcoming back to the program, Alex Salmon, politics writer at Slate. Alex, uh, you've been writing about, well, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about. Some of the pieces you've been writing over at Slate. Uh, I read uh, just about everything you put out, incidentally, and it's uh, it's always great. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, but you wrote about going to a conference and uh, of of car dealerships. And, you know, I feel like I've I've over the years had a sort of like peripheral notion of of what car dealerships mean to the Republican Party and and how much lobbying are, but I never realized to this extent. And um, tell us about like the like what is this? It's a conference. People are going to party. I guess they didn't do it in Vegas this year because somebody said like too many divorces in the past uh, led for that. But aside from the partying. Um, what else is going on in the car dealership? First, talk about how well they did in the pandemic. Yeah, so uh, car dealers, I think, you know, one of the first things to say about them is that they they generally do very, very well. It's an incredibly remunerative industry, um, and they have an astonishing array of legal legal protections, and they make money hand over fist. Um, during the pandemic, they did they did better than they've ever done. The like the two years, you know, two plus years since COVID hit, they um, profit just shot up it, it, to an incredible degree. I think that um, they were making something like one hundred and eighty percent more profit in 2020, 2021, 2022 than they were in twenty nineteen. So just huge, huge increases on uh, an already very, very profitable business. So uh, yeah, the best two year period I think in the history of uh, of, of selling cars. Will you explain how that happened? Do you, or do you know, like, I mean, and, and I was interested to find out that their, their business is sort of like, I don't know. It's like the printer business. Like the printer doesn't, you know, they don't make a big markup on the printer, but they keep getting you on the ink, um, which I didn't ever realize that gets into the whole regulatory uh, stuff and the laws that they lobby for. We could talk about that in a second, but why did they make so much money during the pandemic? Well, there was there was supply chain problems. Obviously, we all sort of know know well. Um, so there were shortages of inventory, which meant that uh, they could pretty much charge whatever they wanted. So, uh, you know, the sticker price of the MSRP was basically only a suggestion, and they were, you know, uh, levying these gigantic markups on new cars were hard to get a hold of. So new cars prices went through the roof. Used cars were hard to get a hold of. So used cars prices went through the roof. Um, and it was just, uh, it was just like a profit bonanza, uh, at a very basic level, like the, just the lack of inventory meant that they could do whatever they wanted. And because a lot of people were, you know, leaving cities or was a lot of, uh, you know, migration sort of internally within the United States. Uh, there was a lot of money being put into people buying cars and, and, uh, and it just, it was a perfect storm for them. So price gouging. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's price gouging uh, yeah, because it's yeah. not, these cars are not costing them any uh, anymore. Now, I suppose, you know, if you're a car dealer, you're like, well, we have less volume because we don't have the same demand. But if they're if they made up for their lack of volume in a price increase, they wouldn't have two hundred nearly 200 percent profits. They would have the same profit margin that they had before. Uh, but this was just like another example of basically of price gouging. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing that you 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 uh, alluded to, which is really critical to point out, is actually they don't even make the majority of their money on selling the cars. They make the majority of the money on uh, on service, on maintenance, on warranty, on financing. Like it's the actually it's the ancillary stuff that is really where they rake it in. And so, um, you know, all those things were obviously booming as well. Uh, the 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 price <laughs> the price gouging uh, applied to many parts of, of the car owning and maintaining process. And I would imagine that, you know, people are taking their cars in more for repairs because they know that the, the, the cost of a new car is that much more expensive and they're going out and buying. And, uh, I mean, I think the whole thing cascaded when like the rental car companies sold off their fleets because they weren't getting any business. But the interesting thing about this predominantly Republican owned business. Like most of these people are Republicans or conservatives. I think that's fair to say is that the reason why they do so well in servicing cars, um, the reason why they almost like have cornered the market, if you will, on these things is because 
not because their service departments are so great. It's because like every Republican who does not like regulation, it's okay in their industry. I mean, talk about the mechanisms in which that um, their uh, their service departments, their warranties, like all of these things are protected by state and local, and if there's any federal laws that essentially prop up this business, which seems to be really not that necessary. Yeah, totally. I think that uh, even if even if in the, you could say even in a generous way that it's a it's a pretty inessential business. Uh, the question of like w- what these record profits went to is something we don't really have to guess about because car dealers are like the most politically organized uh, and militant faction in the country when it comes to conservative politics. And so uh, the reason they make so much and the reason they don't have to worry about these profits going away is because they have put this money directly into lobbying. Uh, at the national, state, local level, into local campaigns, into state level campaigns, and national campaigns. I mean, it's it's an incredibly elaborate uh, political organization, and and the protections that they've won are are astounding. I mean, when I was doing the like the research for this piece, it was like uh, all fifty states have some protections for car dealers. Like, there's not a place, not in the bluest state in the country, uh, are there not protections in place that shore up their industry. Some places, it's so ridiculous where. It's I think there are 16 states. It's flat out illegal for a car manufacturer to sell a car. Uh, it's just against the law. And so like in a place like Texas, which actually has you know a Tesla factories in it, if you buy a Tesla in Texas, it has to be shipped out of the state across state lines and then brought back in so that you can pick it up. In a place like Louisiana, you can't even do over the air software updates to your car because that's a violation of the exclusive uh warranty and uh service protections that dealers have uh for cars so you can't you can't do that at all and like places like new mexico if you want to get service on a car that didn't get bought from a dealership you have to go to uh uh a indian reservation to get it like the, the protections are so extreme and that's just the tip of the iceberg right like uh there are rules that you can't open a car dealership within x number of miles of another car dealership and uh the contracts between car dealerships and car manufacturers are uh interminable they can't be canceled by the, the, the manufacturers it's just like there's basically no no way it's they basically headed off legally every possible way that they might lose money or business and that's just the sort of state of play <laughs> and and just to be clear like that major protection is that car companies um broadly there are exceptions i want to talk about some of those but car companies cannot sell directly to consumers now i can see 50 years ago, why, why there would be a challenge, challenging just logistically for a car company to do that. Maybe 60 years ago, 70 years ago, am I going to buy it through a car or, but they could theoretically just set up a dealership where instead of you carrying a hundred cars in inventory or a thousand cars, all you, all it is for them is like a showroom and there's five cars there. These are the five cars and models we do. Um, and you're talking to a, um, you know, Chrysler representative there who could say like, this is the car, that car, this, and they could sell it to you direct. Um, and you could go, it would create all sorts of other ancillary businesses to repair these cars, uh, because there's not a, you know, one service shop that has a legal monopoly on this. Um, and that's basically when you talk about protections, that's what it is, right? Like you, like they've basically outlawed competition, both to sell the cars and to service the cars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, it never occurred to me why these car dealers, well, let's talk about Tesla for a minute because, uh, I want to touch on um, on DeSantis, <laughs> but DeSantis, it, it, it came up in Florida in an interesting way, just like a couple of weeks ago, I guess, DeSantis uh, signed some bill that um, like enhanced the protections for all these car dealers with an exemption for not all these different EV companies, just one Tesla, right? We, we walk us through sort of that dynamic. Yeah, it's interesting because actually it sort of is a perfect showcase of the political calculation for um, someone with national political ambitions in the GOP. Um, so obviously Ron DeSantis launched his 
his presidential campaign with Elon Musk and Elon Musk. Uh, I don't know if that's obvious because a lot of people couldn't get through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. Rumor has it that this is what happened. Um, and, and the way that Tesla is set up, obviously, is that they have no dealerships. They, they, from the moment of their foundation, decided not to engage with dealerships at all. They would only sell direct to consumer. And like, you know, say what you will about Tesla. Obviously, people have very strong opinions for very good reason about Musk and Tesla and the whole deal. But that was a real serious threat to the dealer lobby and to the, that that mode of business. And so DeSantis is kind of caught between these two poles where he loves mega donors, right? He loves the billionaire class and like uh, and someone like Musk, who's the, the richest person on the planet. Uh, if he comes knocking, DeSantis is going to say, absolutely, what can I do? Um, and so that's why you have that relationship between the two of them. But at the same time, the car dealers are this incredibly formidable political network. And they don't just have a ton of money. They also have really important community relationships because they're, you know, legally there's only allowed to be one car, car dealer per, for every community. So, you know, uh, in in rural areas in particular where they're, you know, they buy a bad space and they sponsor little league teams. And like um, if you want to run against the car dealers uh, apparatus like you are are living dangerously, especially in Republican politics. And so despite uh, DeSantis launching his campaign with the guy who's the enemy of, you know, really the enemy of, of the car dealer faction broadly, he then turns around and signs uh, these bills that lock in some of the most extreme protections for car dealers anywhere in the country, outlawing direct sales for every other car company, uh, period, except for Tesla. So they get the one carve out. And, uh, and then DeSantis also gets to placate these car dealers who have been donating millions of dollars to his campaign already and like, you know, already have a very sort of documented uh, close relationship with him. And uh, and there you have like the two sort of, uh, you know, two major players in conservative politics, you have the, the billionaire class and then you have the, the car dealers and you pretty much need to have both on your team or you have no chance. I want to talk about uh, EVs because I it, it never occurred to me. Uh, the implications of electric vehicles uh, on this particular cohort. But why are they so Republican? Like, is it like I like like what? Why? Why are they so Republican? And, and we should say that they obviously lobby all politicians because we see these protections in blue states uh, almost as much, maybe not quite as severe as in these uh, red states. He said there's 16 states where it's, you know, just sort of off the charts. Uh, and I assume they're all in, uh, you know, a con former Confederate states, frankly. That's right, pro business. Uh, uh, but, but why, why are they, why, why is it, why are car dealers just generally Republican? It's, it's a really interesting question. And I think that, um, it's like kind of one of those great sort of Marxian conundrums where you'd say like, especially with the electric car issue, um, the electric car is a threat to their profit center. The, the fact is that like electric cars are just, are just a better product. They don't require as much maintenance. Uh, you don't have to get the oil changed. Like it's just a better product. And so it requires less maintenance. But the problem with that is that less maintenance means less money for them. And so they hate electric cars for a very sort of simple material reason, which is that they make less than half on an electric car sale that they would make off of uh, a, a gas powered car sale. And that's over the course, the over the course of the, of the lifetime of the car, because yes. it's not just a question of how much do I make on the point of sale? It's that you've been locked into almost like a subscription service for the next 10 years that you own this car, let's say. Right, right, exactly. And it's like, I think people don't even realize how expensive that subscription service is. Um, but with electric cars, right, it's just a lesser, it just takes less to keep them up. And so that means less profit for them. The other thing is that because people are sort of uncomfortable with them, don't know them as well, uh, it takes more to sell one. So it takes more energy to sell one. Uh, the salesman have to learn how the car works, which takes time. Like these things are all, they sound ridiculous, but like we're talking about huge margins on a very, very, very easy job that probably shouldn't exist in the first place. Like uh, any sort of incursion like that is not going to be well received. And so they don't like electric cars for uh, that sort of very basic material reason. But the other thing is that they don't like the electric cars for an ideological reason. And that is when I was at this convention, that was like revealed to me in this incredibly robust and stark and like kind of jarring way is that, um, yes, they, you know, they are invested in Republican politics because Republican politicians have been willing to protect their interests. Uh, but also like this machine, you know, feeds back into itself. And so, like, you know, Greg Gutfeld of Fox News shows up to the thing. 
uh, to the to the to convention. It's not he's not there to talk about the economics of cars. He's he's part of the ideological project, and, uh, and that's a big big part of it. So they just have basically like they and and where did it start? I mean, so I understand like the way like once they realize like okay for whatever reason Republican lawmakers are more amenable to. Um, to doing our bidding, our dollar, our lobbying dollar goes further with a Republican politician do, than it does a, a Democratic one. Um, and then all of a sudden it becomes sort of like a, a self, uh, you know, sort of a self licking ice cream cone. We're going to we're going to make when we get together as a lobbying group, we're going to sort of like be indoctrinate our people uh, more to the right. And then, of course, you know, you're relying on fossil fuels your uh your enemy is maybe the epa uh and you like things to be local because again if you're the car dealer in town uh not only like you say are you uh sponsoring the um the 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 little league team but you know maybe you're also making a good deal for the town supervisor i can put you in that vehicle with like you know, I can be, I give it to you cheap. You're going to get it cheaper, 500 bucks cheaper than anybody else. Um, I mean, there's plenty of room for that to happen, obviously. Where, where did it start? I mean, I, I can't help but think that like, this was like one of those like California Republican type of things. <laughs> I mean, I think that the maybe the, the critical thing to point out is that it's, it's you know, obviously the literally example I think is, is, is pretty apt for the, you know, vast majority of this country. But at the same time, car dealers make a ton of money. Like this is a group in the in in the top 0.1 percent of American earners. Like this is one of the top five most common professions. Um, there was another breakdown of like census data. That How said, much like, does a car dealer make? Like 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 a, like typically? How much? They the the um it was what uh, car dealers, beverage distributors, and contractors, or maybe it was gas station owners. Those three jobs make up more than half of the businesses that pull in like $1.6 million or more per year. Like this is really like the elite, like it doesn't seem like an elite uh, sort of thing. It's not like a hedge fund manager, but you know, this is really, this is what the American elite really looks like. This is what that class is really composed of. And so like when we're talking about tax code and we're talking about, you know, sort of a class composition, these, this is the very richest, these are the very richest people in America in a lot of very meaningful ways. And so obviously their, their fealty and their, uh, their fealty to and their affinity for the Republican party is kind of comes down on that. It's, it's, you know, like the way that the Trump uh, tax cuts were, were structured, like for one example, was basically to advantage car dealerships uh, so that they would be immune to uh, sort of like the tax bill that you would expect for businesses of this size that are that profitable. And it's like these family businesses, you can hand them down, they get carve outs from, you know, Republican tax policy. And like, that's, I think, sort of how they found a home on this side of the aisle. And, uh, and obviously have been thriving there ever since. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, well, it's a fascinating story. Um, and, uh, people can check that out, but I wanted to also just touch on one other story that you've written. I guess you wrote it maybe today um about uh yeah it was today um desantis's super PAC. um this is an extraordinary story and it just like we're we're at i mean we've been on the brink and it's sort of like uh, ebbs and flows but it is extraordinary on a day where um it was revealed or last night about this sort of uh you know alito and is getting a, uh, you know, he has his own personal billionaire as opposed to Clarence Thomas's personal billionaire. And um, I just, whenever I read a story about these super PACs, I just remember, you know, Anthony Kennedy saying like, well, disclosure and, uh, and you know, we don't have to worry, you know, uh, money and uh, speech are the same thing, that type of thing. We're, in this story you do about DeSantis has basically moved the the degradation of of our campaign finance laws to a another level. Like this is uh, a, a milestone in the sort of, I guess, revealing of just how decrepit our our campaign finance laws are. Will you will you just explain? Uh, what he's set up and what he's doing that is so sort of like novel. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty astounding because I think if it works and like, you know, it may not work because, you know, we've, you've seen his polling numbers and he's not running away with it, but 
he basically is like setting out a new blueprint for for uh big money to 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 buy off a presidential election i mean it's it's pretty astounding so he has the super PAC, which is um never back down um the super PAC, i think on a basic level is just illegally funded so he can we just he, stop he, for a moment and just go like really like never <laughs> back down i mean uh yeah well so it it's 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 funded. So it's funded with eighty two and a half million dollars. The thing that's interesting about this is that it's almost certainly illegal by the letter of campaign finance law. So he raised two hundred million dollars in Florida while he was running for governor um, via his Empower Parents super PAC. Um, but obviously didn't need to spend all that to win the governor's race in Florida. So he had eighty two, eighty three million dollars still sitting there. And you you know, by the letter of the law, are not allowed to move money that was raised in a state in a state race for a state race into a federal race. Uh, DeSantis, they just took the $82 million from empower parents pack. That was for statewide Florida race, moved it right into this, uh, federal race, uh, into this federal pack, uh, of never back down. And, um, and basically it was like, we don't think the FEC is going to do anything. Uh, and if they do, it'll be too late. And so they, they are starting with this $82.5 million head start. And rather than, uh, you know, DeSantis is building out a campaign with volunteers and like door knocking the stuff that, you know, is kind of like the fiber of American democracy and campaigning. I mean, we don't need to make it overly romantic, but that's kind of like a core function at the very least. They're having the super PAC run the entire ground game for DeSantis in four separate states right now. So they're spending a hundred million dollars uh, to hire professional door knockers and run the entire grass quote unquote grassroots operation uh independently so the, the super PAC is not allowed to not allowed to collaborate with this DeSantis campaign technically that's again the law as decided by the Supreme Court was that this is okay because super PACs don't uh collaborate with campaigns and they're just letting their super PAC which is again funded not in a in a, in a legal way uh do all the essential functions of the campaign and they're just going to sit back and, and basically like let the super PAC run run the show it's almost as if the super PAC is the campaign. And so you can't collaborate with a separate entity that doesn't exist because they're doing all of the functions of the campaign. Right. And it's like, and like, you know, you may say like, Oh, well that doesn't sound that crazy. It's a pretty crazy workaround because the, like you're technically by the, I keep saying this, but you know, technically by the, the FEC regulations that exist, they should have only been able to transfer $5,000 from empower parents back into the DeSantis campaign. Uh, instead, they moved eighty-two and a half million dollars. So basically, what they're saying is there is no campaign finance law. We will raise infinite money from whoever we want to, and we will put it to doing whatever basic campaign function we decide we we need to do. Um, and in the case of DeSantis, because he has so little grassroots support, it's like, all right, we're going to astroturf a massive, just incredible ground game. Um, and that's what they're doing. But it's 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 pretty astounding. Like, we've never seen anything like this. And surely the FEC is going to crack down on this, right? <laughs> well, the funny thing is that, yeah, the 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 way they got this idea was from another Florida politician, Byron Donalds, who is Freedom Caucus uh, stalwart. And he did the same thing, albeit with a much smaller amount of money when he left the Florida State House uh, and decided to run for Congress. He moved one hundred and seven grand out of his state level pack into his congressional race pretty clearly not allowed to do it, but the FEC has three Republican chairs and three Democrats. And of course, when it came time to decide on the legality of this, they deadlocked and the Republicans said it was fine. And the Democrats said it was not fine, which is, does not mean that it's legal. It just means that they are, you know, gridlocked and toothless. Uh, and that's the DeSantis campaign basically identified as a green light. They said, you know, if, if Donald's can do it, we can do it too. So then they decided to do it by a factor of 800 X. Uh, so <laughs> is there that's... no other entity that can, that can enforce campaign finance laws? I mean, I understand I... that we have an agency ostensibly set up to do that, but it's, it has been designed in such a way that it really doesn't take any, um, it doesn't take any enforcement action, uh, or can't take any enforcement action unless it's probably to, uh, protect an incumbent or something to that effect. <laughs> But is there no other entity? Can can the DOJ can't say like, you know, there's some clear law breaking happening over here? Or did it just like, do you do you have to come from this special 
you know, uh, police entity called the, um, the, the, the federal elections commission to deal with it. I think that there is the, the Southern district of New York, uh, that, that at least that court has been pretty effective on campaign finance stuff in the past. Like, uh, the George Santos, uh, hot water, I think is coming from there. Uh, when Sam Bankman freed went down, um, it was, it was there. And part of, obviously part of that indictment was based on campaign finance law. So it's not like impossible that there may be some consequence for this. And like DeSantis doesn't get away with breaking the rules uh, in the same way that Trump does, right? Like he's, DeSantis would like to be Trump and he's not Trump in a lot of ways. And one of the ways he's not Trump is like his panache with rule breaking. Um, so it is possible. The problem is like, you know, either if this works and DeSantis is president, well, then there are going to be no consequences because he will just you know, uh, pardon himself or whatever he'll, you know, he will ensure that there will be no consequences. There might not, there might not even be a department of justice by the time he's done, given what he said, uh, on the campaign trail. So, um, you know, if it works, if it works, it works. Uh, if it doesn't, there might be some, you know, maybe there's something down the road, uh, but it's, it, it'll take a while at, at the very least. <laughs> Alex Salmon, politics writer at Slate. We'll put a link, uh, to all of your pieces, particularly the, uh, the, uh, the car dealership and this uh, super PAC piece. I really appreciate you coming on and talking to us about it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me.